All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for stopping by another at Google talk. We're very pleased and honored to um, have with us today Chris Fedak and Josh Schwartz, the co creators and co producers of the hit NBC show Chuck. Hit. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can do anything at Google. All right. <laughs> which, which, is on its, um, which is on its final season um, th this week. We're, for those of you that are watching the archive footage, um, our talk today will cover. Um, spoilers up until the final three episodes, um, with the, uh, the last ones airing next week. And we also solicited questions on, on Google Moderator, so thank you to all the, the fans who submitted some extra questions. We'll, we'll get those in as well. Um, but Chris and Josh, what I wanted to start out with is just you know, talk about the, the characters on Chuck. I think that's one of the, um, the center parts of the show, is, is the character development that's happened over five seasons. Sure. I'm Josh, by the way. That's Chris, just to clarify. Um, well, I think for us, I mean, character was always the most integral part of the show. By the way, should I be looking at the camera or the room? You what, can, you can like, what's, you, what's better for the? You, uh, you, you can like, you can look at the camera, but then you can like scan the room so that, that way. Seduce the camera, or yeah. just kind of like right. passing glances. Right. Well, All right. you can, you know, make sure everybody's you know, a little wave. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, for us, character was always uh, the most kind of integral element to the show because obviously there was this high concept the show of a guy who gets a computer downloaded in his brain and there was going to be action and there was going to be um, all that kind of fun but I think for us it was always a character story it was always a story of an underdog a guy who felt like his whole life he had been he had all this potential they had never really fulfilled and uh, what do you do when you're given the opportunity to finally live up to that potential you know that sort of outsider underdog element to Chuck's character and for us the litmus test is always if you pull out of the story a guy gets a computer downloaded into his brain, are these still a group of characters that you want to hang out with? And that was really the challenge that we had for ourselves in starting out with the show. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Chuck's home life, his family life, obviously the weirdos that work at the Buy More, all those people really wanting to feel like these are characters you're going to hang with and see evolve regardless of what bad guys of the week they're dealing with. Absolutely. And I, I think the other thing, too, is that when we first down, sat down to talk about the show, we were all going through, I guess, you know, that kind of late quarter life crisis of like, you know, you're, you're on the cusp of being like an actual legitimate adult. And um, I think that Chuck kind of echoes that in a way, especially his like growth over the years, is that we started off in season one as a guy who didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And for each season of the show, Chuck has changed from the guy who didn't know it, couldn't figure it out, to figuring out that he does want to be a spy, you know? And it's that, that evolution was something that we really did want to track, because we felt like it, in a way, it's like being a spy kind of echoed at what people are going on in their lives at this point. And, um, uh, and that was a lot of fun. We always talked about, you were, you were asking about sort of the evolution of the characters over the series, and obviously, you know, one of the biggest things was Chuck's secret, and as his friends and the people in his life started to find out about that and get pulled into that world, that would obviously have a tremendous impact on Chuck, but also, on people like Captain Awesome. Nice t-shirt, yeah, by well, the thank way. You. Gonna, thank you, I came prepared. I'm yeah. gonna plug your t-shirt. We did not give that to him. He was wearing it when we got here. And, um, and Morgan and his sister, uh, Ellie. And so I think that was a, a key part of the show, when to, when to have that information leak out, when to have people find out. And the other big thing, obviously, was the sort of the, the Chuck Sarah love story. And as Chris said, you know, in the beginning of the show, Chuck didn't know what he wanted to do. Um, but he had this group of friends and he had his family and, and he had his like personal life pretty well figured out, his professional life not so much. And Sarah was someone who was going to come into his world who had her professional life completely figured out, but had no personal life. And actually when we met her in the pilot, Bryce Larkin, we found out was her ex-lover, had just been murdered. Um, and you know, she was someone who was always kind of the, the kick-ass CIA agent who never really had a family, never really had friends. So Chuck was always going to be kind of um, envious and, and excited and looking up to her world. And Sarah was always going to be looking up to his world as well, and how nice it would be just to be able to like be a human and relax and have friends and hang out. Um, and so watching kind of Chuck become more of a badass spy, mm -hmm. as you were saying, and then watching Sarah become more human, reconnect with her family, be okay with having feelings and emotions, those were two of the main, I think, kind of character spines that, that ran through the, the show. Absolutely, and I think the other thing too is that it's really two people from two different TV shows running into each other and kind of really <laughs> wanting to be each other in each other's television show. So, I mean, it's always been a mashup in that way, and I think that, because uh, Sarah Walker should be the star of a television show in her own right. And John Casey obviously thinks he's the star of his own show. Exactly. <laughs> he feels like that Jack Bauer guy was a huge pussy, and if it had been John Casey on 24, it would have gotten 12 hours. He yeah. wouldn't need, John Casey wouldn't need 24 hours. <laughs> That's very shiny. And also, um, one, one thing I, I, I noticed in the character development was the relationship between Morgan and Ellie as well. They started uh -huh. out as 
basically enemies with Morgan as this like creepy stalker person, and <laughs> yeah. then towards the end, you know, that Morgan came into his own as a mature, he sure did. Adult. <laughs> he grew into that. that he, he grew into that beard. That's for damn sure. <laughs> Somebody coming in? I'd like to join us? Um, yeah, no, I think uh, I, I, Morgan was interesting. We've we've actually done a little bit of looking back on Morgan because Josh Gomez is this tremendously likable guy with this tremendously likable beard, and we always felt like. Uh, he was going to be this great comic energy on the show, and the first season people really hated him. They hated him. They're like, who is this dipshit Morgan? Mm. Hello. And, uh, Ooh, that looks tasty. Yeah. So good. Soup for us? No? All right. All right. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that we, we, knew we needed to work on after the first season was, how do we get people to like Morgan as much as we like Josh Gomez? Yeah. And we know people will like Morgan. And part of the issue is that Morgan was always in the way. It was like Chuck was trying to go on a mission, and bumbling Morgan was kind of stopping him from being able to do that. Mm -hmm. And once Morgan started to get a little bit of swagger of his own, got to be the assistant bar manager, which is, you know, it's a good way to feel your oats. Um, <laughs> and sort of, and be more of like the Alfred to Chuck's Batman. Yeah. Um, that became a role for Morgan that really allowed Josh's comic gifts to flourish and, and and for the character to really click, I think, with audiences. But there's a real fear when you're working in TV, especially when you have a show where someone has a secret, like Chuck's secret, especially in those first couple of seasons, was that the whole show is dependent on people not knowing. And I think what, one of the realizations we had was that the show kind of got better and better the more people who found out and kind of became a part of the, you know, the, the Carmichael team. And I think that it really started with Josh Gomez in, in uh, season three. You know, we knew that halfway through the season, I think episode nine, we were going to want to have, you know, Josh well, find awesome out. Well, found out. Right, Austin awesome found it at the end of season yeah. two. And that's great, and it was fun, and allowed us to just do make, I just make sure you've seen the show. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. I watch it from afar. Um, but yeah, that was important. I mean, th that was a big part of why you know, the show, we were able to go for five seasons and 91 episodes, was because it was fun to bring people into that world, because what was also great about Gomez is he was a great fish out of water, and that by that point, you know, Chuck had become somewhat knowledgeable, somewhat good at being a spy, kind of good. Um, so Gomez was kind of our new guy, our new wide-eyed participant. In the he spiral. became the new Chuck. Yeah. yeah. And also, in terms of letting people know about the secret, we always thought we were getting canceled. <laughs> so uh, you know, you're always like, well, we could be getting canceled. Someone should find out before we get canceled. Yeah, It'd be yeah. awesome. Hey, we didn't get canceled. <laughs> all right. Somebody else should find out. Um, and then Jeff found out everything. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which we always joked from the beginning is Jeff would find out everything and then forget the next day. Which I think we did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, from the very beginning. Yeah. But actually, a lot of people don't know, when we first started working on the show, Chris, is, Chris had this great idea at the time that Captain Awesome was actually going to turn out to be a bad guy. You're going to find out later on that he was like a spy. He was planted there. He was you know, the enemy. And the whole relationship with Ellie had been a fraud. And, then, um, and I always said that was super cool. It was something we were going to, yeah, yeah, a yeah. bomb we were going to drop at the end of season one. And then we cast Ryan McPartland as Captain Awesome. And everybody loved him. From the get-go, the first time he said the word awesome. Three lines. Three lines and you love the guy. Way to go. Awesome. Yeah. And people were like, I'm in. I'm in with yeah. that guy. Don't die. So he, he's going to be the bad guy. He can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> people love him. We very quickly realized we should not make our most, one of our most likable people the villain. Yeah, yeah. Maintain that, that family. Um, exactly. Family. Yeah. And once Morgan got a love life of his own, he became much less creepy to Ellie, too, I would True. Say. True. And then also, I really like the development that happened with the minor characters at the Bymore. I was wondering, is there? Well, I would not refer to them as minor if they're watching this at all. <laughs> well, like I mean, people like right now, and Skip, right now, like, oh, Fernando like, and Skip, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that yeah. minor fine, minor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, that's gonna be scary tonight. Yeah. yeah, there will. Yeah, you will see Jeffster again before the show is done. You will see them again. Um, yeah, those guys are those guys have been part of the show for five years, and uh, and they get their due as well. Yeah, they also get lines in the final episode. Fernando, Skip, and some of the guys from uh, who've been in the Bymore back there will actually have lines in our final episode. Yeah, but that's that's a part of the discovery of the show. I think that like when we first started working on the show, we shot our first episode. The pilot was shot in a, I believe a Comp USA, which was you know at the prime, going out of business, so we could only shoot like very, in the middle of the night. Very very sad. Very sad. Um, then when we when we built the Bymore, we had a kind of you know once we got a pickup, we, we built the actual stage, we had it, you know, kind of populated with people, and those people, like, the more as the show kind of, we went on, we started to write to them in the background, so we would write to Fernando or to Skip, and to make certain that we were always kind of, like, folding them into the story in odd ways, even though they didn't say anything, we always kind of imagined they were having their own stories back there. And yeah, some Sarah's high school reunion, when there was the big rager at the Bymore, I think, that's uh, right. Yeah. he got something on the couch. He yeah. did get something yeah. on the couch. Uh, but even in terms of Jeff and Lester, you know, um, uh, who are the stars of Chuck, if you ask, you know, Jeff or Lester. Um, that, uh, that when we were shooting the pilot, they didn't have much to do in that, in that episode. They had a couple of lines. 
Um, but they were so weird and they had such an interesting chemistry that we're like, we have to keep writing for these people. But when we tested the show, you know, you always have to test your pilot, you know, um, the, the network and the studio do, people thought they were the bad guys. <laughs> just, based <laughs> on, just based on three lines. Right. So we had to work very, very hard to not have them become the super villains. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So I also wanted to transition to the, the, the fan following, the cult following of Chuck. I think sure. that was one thing that, um, that continued and grew, and, and from the Subway sandwiches <laughs> to the campaigns to the napkins. I wanted to ask just um, how, how much attention did you pay to the, the fan um, sort of revolution, and, and will that affect your, your future work as well? Oh, we 100% pay attention to it. And I think we've been very vocal in our gratitude towards our fans, and I think our cast has done an amazing job of Anytime the fans, you know, have events, those guys are every single one of them is there, and everyone's so appreciative. And I mean, the, you know, the, the fans really did mobilize in a very unique and clever way. You referenced sandwiches, 100%. That was unheard of. Yeah. No one had ever eaten sandwiches as a sign of protest before. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's also a really savvy way. I mean, just like our fans have always been very, very clever and smart when it comes to, you know, we've done product integration in the show, so they latched onto that. And it was a great idea because it's great when you know, the NBC is deciding out should they pick up the show or not, and the CFO of Subway gives them a call. They just say, hey, we like that show that's, you know, that we're getting all this kind of sandwich you know, <laughs> excitement about. It's like that's, that's, that's only a helpful thing, and it just speaks to the savviness of, of, uh, of the Chuck It's Pack. amazing that Subway wanted to stay in business with us <laughs> after Jeff revealed that his sandwich of choice was the Taroni. The tuna, tuna Oh, roni, God, yeah, it was amazing. Was tuna and pepperoni. Yeah. That was Jeff's Subway sandwich. You felt like right there, Subway should have <laughs> ended their relationship with us. Or have like some secret menu. Yeah, but it was a show for the fans. I mean, look, we were fans of the kind, but there were certain things, movies and, and shows that we grew up on that inspired us and influenced us. And I think there was like a common language in the DNA of the show, just in terms of you know, the, the, the genre of the show, the tone of the show, the references that were built into the show, episodes inspired by things. and guest stars we had on the show that spoke really directly to those things. So there was a real common language and lore um, that we had in talking about the show, and it became a conversation that extended to the fans. The fans, you know, I think, loved the same references that we did, mm -hmm. and were excited about those same things, and got everything. There was never an homage, there was never a guest star, there was anything that the fans didn't pick up on, and also appreciate that it was part of that same conversation. And I think Comic-Con was also a huge thing for the show, Again, we were very, you know, we weren't necessarily um, high on the radar at NBC when we premiered. I don't know that we've ever been high on the radar no. at NBC. Um, but when we got to Comic-Con that first time, we were like, is anyone even going to come to this panel? Does anyone care? The room was full. The show got a standing ovation. It was the, great, the greatest feeling in the world. I think we were like hugging each other, and we do not like to touch each other no. um, <laughs> very, very often. And, uh, and the following year, we went back, and the room was bigger. And then the following year, Jeffster performed, and the, like, it was like... Uh, you know, it was very disturbing, the, the euphoria <laughs> people had for, for Woodside. People were taking their shirts off, mostly men, and um, <laughs> for them. And they were really, you know, and so just that having that opportunity, when you make a TV show, it's not like making a movie where you get to sit in the back of the theater and watch the movie with the audience. There's very few opportunities where you get to watch your show with an audience. And I think Comic-Con, WonderCon, um, what's the one in New York? Comic-Con Comic -Con, New, Comic New York, very creatively named. Um, <laughs> I think all of those opportunities for us to get with the fans and watch the show with them and interact with them have always been tremendously rewarding. Yeah, and it's something you really couldn't build either. Like it's it's 100% it's organic. You can't fake that. You can't believe me. If you could, we would have tried. Uh, but it's something that just took on a life of its own. And I think we just kind of stood back yeah. and watched as um, you know it really took form and and the network had to had to acknowledge it. It could not be ignored. You know, yeah. they, made a, they made a statement that was really powerful on behalf of the show. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think that, 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 uh, that uh, experience at Comic-Con was really a moment for us where we felt like we had kind of like, we had tapped into something in the sense that Chuck was a great way, Chuck the character was a great way to kind of bring people into this world, into this show, and to meet these people. And I remember by the, by the point that you got to the end of the episode and you saw Casey and Sarah in the buy more and you had an idea of what this show was going to be, that it was just a, you know, people were just really jazzed to see what was going to happen next. And, um, uh, and for us, that, that theatrical experience is like, you just don't get that. You know, it's like usually we send the show off, people watch it at home, they have their own personal experience with it. But the weird thing about it, our show is we found this in San Francisco as well, is that it plays great with a theater, it plays great with an audience. And uh, it's probably because we've always designed it in a, in a way as a little summer blockbuster each week. And um, uh, yeah. So we're going to take the show on the road now that it's over. Exactly. Yeah. No. The vaudeville production of Chuck. In, in theaters on Yes, Broadway. exactly. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, I would go see it. Season six on stage. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so it's transitioning. Ice capades. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> or Chuck capades. Yeah. All right. Or, or or an opera. I mean, I think. Wow. Like dramatic Whoa. opera. Interesting. Get some big, big All right. stage guys. Pavarotti as yeah. the new villain. All right. Is he still with Big us? Jeff and Lester so. right in the okay. middle. Uh, and, and also looking looking over across the four seasons, or the five seasons, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what do you say was your favorite Chuck moment um, across the episodes? Ooh. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I, you know, it's a, oh, for, for the life of me, there's been t every episode of the show kind of turns into a child in a way. Some of them loved a little bit, you know, less than others. <laughs> some of them cuter than others. Some of them definitely <laughs> cuter than others. But I think that there was, there's been some, you know, the. I think the moment of Sarah and Chuck coming together for the first time, you know, in episode 13, I think that I'm a, there was a, a, in, an episode called Chuck versus the Colonel. These are all romantic elements. I, I guess in, over, over the years, I started off the show, when we first started talking about the show, you know, I loved action movies, and that's, you know, kind of what I kind of focused on. But over the, I turned into a big, soft-hearted romantic, you know, working that's what on I the do Chuck to Chris, yeah. <laughs> I was the teen soap guy, and he was like, Girly guy, and I he was the he was John Casey. Yeah, I walked around calling you the girly guy. You did, um, but no, it's like over the years I've found those those big romantic moments to be my favorite. So Sarah and Chuck in the in the hotel room and the Colonel episode, you know, making out in the bed. It's just like these great kind of you know you, what you find in television is about it's about relationships, and I think that that's something I didn't understand when we first got into the show was that you start working on a pilot, and it's very much like a little movie, um, but really television is about people and families and interact those interactions. And I think that for me, it's those big moments in our finale. We're going to have a couple of moments that are um, uh, definitely, you know, some of the best of the series as well, because it's about the characters. It's about those two people, th these people interrelating. And I think that I'm, uh, I think those Sarah Chuck moments are, are always my favorite. I'd say, yeah, the end of season two, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, the wedding and Chevy Chase is marching through the wedding, and there's yeah. paratroopers crashing through the skylights, and Jeffster's performing, and Chuck downloads the new Intersect, and suddenly he knows kung fu. I mm -hmm. think for us. You know, that would have been something we wanted to do even at the end of season one, but we couldn't because the writer's strike hit halfway through right. season one. And so there was just so much anticipation and build up. Um, and so the, the opportunity to, to do that um, and those episodes just really came together. It was also the last time we had any money to make the show. Yeah. <laughs> season two was the end of the money. Yeah. Um, but that's, so, that, that, was a, that was a great moment because, like, we always said from the get go, it's like our show isn't about a guy with superpowers, it's not a guy with abilities. The computer only gives them information. And then somewhere along the process, Josh was like, well, what happens <laughs> if we give him abilities? And then from that point on, it was like, well, that's a great way into the second part of the show, which is Chuck wanting to be a spy. So that moment was a huge moment for us. It's like, you know, can we pull it off? And then can Zach Levi do it? And he could, and we realized the, the show was possible from the, there on out. It's like Zach could do all these kind of amazing mm -hmm. spy skills. There's also a moment in season three where Chuck and Sarah are tied up, and, uh, or season four, remind me. It's all a blur. Which one, which one? Which where, uh, where with the, you with know. Rome? Oh, where they do the battle, like. No, where Dalton's standing over him. And you know Volkov and Mary oh, yeah, so the are standing yeah. off are standing over him, and we just like looked at each other. We're like, it's James Bond yeah. and Sarah Connor kicking our characters' asses. This yeah. is amazing. Like yeah. this was everything we'd ever wanted when we were like 12 years old, yeah. and uh, that was kind of that was pretty exciting. Chuck versus the first fight, which is one of our best yeah. episodes, definitely. You know, I mean, getting to work with Timothy Dalton is just like it's just super amazing, because. It, you know, it's like he takes that energy you see on screen is like that all the time. <laughs> you know, so Timothy actually would, would come to our, you know, come to the writers' offices and sit down with us and go through the script, which is just amazing. There's James Bond and he's acting it out here in the office, and we're like we're sorting out the story. It's amazing. And I, I also, you know, looking at Google, we have a big. I'd say a, a cultural following and cultural um, resemblance to, to Life at the Bymore. We got we have our own, we have our own nerd herd here. To take Much nicer here from what I, little I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and we, we would focus a lot on really designing great products, too. And so thinking about the intersect, you know, one thing that, that struck Are my mind. Are you guys mind, building that here? Well, <laughs> I, well, Can't talk about they, that. I understand. I, I, haven't done, I haven't been on the complete tour in Los Angeles, got so it. I can't answer that All right. Um, but there, the so those at home, there was a big cut right there. Something was discussed, and we just come back into the conversation. <laughs> we've been tra we've been tranked, reprogrammed, and we're back. Yeah, back to the intersect. Um, but so, what was the product development life cycle like for for the intersect? I mean, at first, it's like this oh, thing that can like. This is a feedback question. Oh, thanks a lot. That's like a like, government like, question. Yeah, that's yeah, about the like, government. Like, like, yeah, thanks. Gives you frosted tips. You know how do how do we get from killing a person to frosted tips? How do we get from the killing a person to frosted tips? Well, I think I think the first thing there's many there's been a couple of different iterations. Um, of the computer, um, God, I'm not going to go through them because you know it'll, I need a flowchart. But chart. if you put on these sunglasses, you will get a download. 
which is also much, which also works much faster now than it did the first time Chuck yeah. did it. <laughs> um, but I think that you know, you know, when we were first uh, talking about the intersect, it was something that we didn't quite know exactly what it could do and how it could affect Chuck. But he was the perfect match for it in some ways, chosen by his father. Um, but this season, season four, um, we thought about the intersect in a different way. Um, in the sense that we'd seen that Shaw had uploaded the intersect into his head and, we, and it had a certain effect. Um, but what would happen if, if the intersect had a different effect on each person who brought it in? What if, you get, what if it was more like the ring of power? You know, what if you actually made it into something that when someone uploaded the intersect, it would affect their personality as well? And so for Morgan, we thought, wouldn't it wouldn't be great to see Morgan as the intersect, and wouldn't it be great if it also turned him into a gigantic douche? You know? <laughs> So, um, uh, so that was something that we, we, um, uh, we began to think about as season four, is the intersect is a scary thing that you don't want in your head. And maybe only one person really can have it inside their head and be able to handle it, and that's Chuck Bartowski. And he doesn't have it this year. It always winds up in somebody else. So it's, if, it's not, if it's not Morgan, it's Shaw. And now, as we've seen at the end of um, uh, the last episode, it's, Sarah's, it's in Sarah's head. And in these final couple of episodes, we're going to see what the effect is on Sarah Walker. So does she flash or zoom or something? She flashes. <laughs> well, she certainly flashes. And Whoa. Sarah Walker flashes. That could really get people to watch. Also, fantastic. Yes, please. <laughs> and and uh, along those lines, we had a question from FJ85 on oh YouTube. Thanks for, for writing in. Um, she wanted, or he, he or she wanted to know the most dangerous stunt that Yvonne has ever done. How about the, the rest of the cast? Most dangerous that Yvonne has ever done was probably almost kissing Lester. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That was dangerous for both of them. I don't know, I mean, Yvonne is such a sport. I remember Michael Clark Duncan, you know, who's like seven feet tall and weigh, outweighs her by several hundred pounds, just yeah. walloping her on a rooftop. And uh, that must have been pretty dangerous. That was an amazing sequence. They also had to wire her for that sequence. Yeah. Because he would hold her up in the air. So she was up on a rooftop, wired into a rig. She, I mean, the, She's fearless. They're fearless. Zach yeah. and Yvonne are, it's amazing what they will do. In many of those instances, when you were watching something, it was actually them doing it. And... Uh, the, 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 the Thai fighting scene, it's oh, like yeah. all those sequences are, are, are what's, what's amazing about them is just how close they get. It's like when they're working on a fight sequence, we have an uh, incredible um, uh, um, stunt coordinator, Mary Yanka, and he can really get Zach and Avant into those sequences in a very close and intimate way. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's an amazing group. So it's, it's very controlled, it's very safe, um, but it's... Um, Right for Morgan, his most dangerous stunt is walking anywhere. Walking anywhere. It's Gomez. It's in like one season, he was he was grabbed around the throat by former New York Giants Michael Strahan. That's true. And then he was uh, line drive to the ground by uh, Jerome Bettis, aka the Bus, <laughs> for, you know, formerly of the Steelers. So I think uh, we probably put him through the ringer that year. That's probably yeah, probably the most yeah. dangerous. Yeah. And then, yeah my, but for for but for uh, for Zach, we started season three. I think with Z no season two with Zach hanging out a window. Yeah. And that's Zach hanging out a window of a, of, a, of, a, of a downtown warehouse here in Los Angeles, six stories up. And it's one of those moments where you're thinking to yourself, we're going to hang the star of the show off the side of the building. And one, Zach wants to do it because he wants to, he, he's a director at heart. So he wants the shot to be amazing. And then two, but you really have to, like, you know, you have to trust your team. You have to know that there's a bunch of invisible, you know, things that are protecting your crew. But it's, uh, it's, 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 it's still six stories up. And uh, for me, it was, I sat there the most nervous person on the set. Cool. And, and we also, like, grow, going back to fans paying extra special attention to every nuanced detail in the uh -huh. episodes. We have a person. That sounds like a mistake. <laughs> like finding uh, every mistake, yes. Uh, well, Jonas Life 10 says in the pilot episode of Chuck, every time Chuck flashes, he sees a picture of a slice of pie. Uh -huh. Is there deep symbolism in the pie, or is the cake a lie? That, oh. There was a lot of meetings on that. <laughs> there was a lot of pie meetings. Um, we, we, when we first started working on the, um, uh, on the show, the, the, we were trying to imagine what, how exactly the intersect would work. And so each, each episode would have a different mission, would have a different set of flashes, and that each flash would have an album cover. And so the apple pie was the album cover. And it would for, have an image that was very innocuous, very right. kind of uh, non-threatening, and what's less threatening than apple pie? Unless you're allergic to apples, and so you, so so there'd be the apple pie, and then inside of it would be all this, you know, it would be all this spy data, mm -hmm. and then at the very end of it, you would close it off with the apple pie, uh -huh. and we did that for the pilot, and I <laughs> don't know if we did it ever again. It was just like I don't know if we need that. You I know, think we, we tried. I think there's always like some weirdly innocuous image, at least in the beginning. That's right. I mean, actually, there was a wall in, in, in the in, in the editorial department which was filled with these album covers. 
And I'd be like a puppy, a baby. It was just you know whatever it was, and that was the that inside that image, the mission was encoded. And so when they're flashing, they're kind of as Chris saying they're opening the album cover and then playing the contents of the yeah. right, of which, the album, which is the mission, which would all link back up to what was downloaded in Chuck's head in the pilot episode. Um, but once we got into the um, uh, into the uh, spy abilities, everything changed. You know, it's like we we came up with a different format for that. So that was the original idea. Oh, cool. And and in terms of names for episodes, does that come early in the process? How do you choose? The I Chuck think Chris. Versus? Yeah, Chris named the first episode Chuck versus the helicopter, Good. and and uh, and I, I, from that on, we're like, let's just go with versus every week, and that became just, you know, it was always Chuck versus something. That's right. Yeah. You know, from the outset. And and one one final question I had on the on the plot is. Um, especially with the episodes in, um, in Chuck vs. the Baby when some of the, the pre-story, um, the, the origin story of Chuck sh shifted a little bit in terms of Sarah's involvement, Bryce Larkin and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, looking back at the series, what's the role for, um, for free will um, in, in, in the, in the oh, show? Like, wow. Was Chuck chosen? We've you debated know? that a lot. I mean, once you found out, you know, that, that, um, you know, that his father had kind of, you know, built it for him and was kind of searching for him. Right. And he was searching for his dad without knowing it, uh, and that he had downloaded once when he was a child. Mm -hmm. We definitely, there was a lot of debates about free will. Well, I think and, was he, and was he selected? And was it, was it Luke Skywalker or, or was Parker. he Spider-Man? You know, was he Peter Parker? Was he just bitten by a random spider? Or was he always meant to be a hero? I think that one of the, I think for us, especially going into the show, we started off as a Peter Parker story. We started off as the guy who, it was a mistake. The, we, we, the first versions of the pitch, it's like Bryce Larkin was trying to send an email to really important spies. The CIA, right. but it yeah. said he was one letter short, so he, one Chuck. name short. So Chuck was right above CIA in his, you know, smartphone. And, uh, but I think that as the show went on, I think that we found that the mythology, we wanted to build out the family story. Because we found it that we, it was really a family story, so... Um, uh, so we, we began to build it more along the lines of Luke Skywalker as opposed to Peter Parker. And it's like there would be that the family would have been in some ways tangentially related to the spy world and that Chuck would be discovering more. And that was something that was a, that was a, that was a realization over those first six episodes of the pilot. From the pilot on, we were kind of seeing that there was going to be a darker, deeper world here. Yeah, and, and even when the decision comes to you know, either, either kick ass or save your family, Chuck's going to save his family. Every so. time, yep. That's, that's pretty, one of, I think, one of the best messages of the, of the show. Um, also, do you think... Always save your family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then kick ass. Yeah. Right. Yeah, do, the, does the show match what you initially envisioned as well when you, know, when you first cast a pilot to, to writing the final episode? Has your, um, ha, has your thoughts on the show changed? Or? Well, I think as Chris was saying, I mean, one of the great things about television is you, you, know, is you have the opportunity to continue to explore characters. So obviously in your head, the pilot is a movie. You want that movie to succeed well enough to have a sequel. You actually want 100 sequels. That's the goal. <laughs> and, um, and, but as you start to get to know your actors better and you start to be able to kind of know their voices and, and you know, things evolve. And I think there's just like a natural evolution to, to how the series goes. So I feel like it's still very true mm -hmm. to where we started, but yet it's kind of had all of these great offshoots and tangents and, you know, right. uh, characters that seem like supporting characters getting huge storylines of their own and, Romances failing right. and coming together, and John Casey's got a daughter, and Morgan's dating her, and those are things that you know are possibilities when you're first planting those seeds during the pilot. But you really need to be able to, you know, have enough episodes to be able to like let all that stuff grow and evolve. And, and I think that there are certain things, certain pillars that we wanted to get to throughout the show. One, we wanted to give Chuck the abilities at the end of season two, and then there was also a thing which was more amorphous: is that we wanted to build a team. We kind of had the idea of Carmichael Industries in season three, that we wanted to turn this into kind of a motley team that would go out and get into trouble. And we liked that idea. So bringing people into the spy world was also kind of a part of it. But you're right, it's a discovery. It's like there's a certain point when you're sitting in the editing bay and something's just like, we got it. We have to explore that more. We have to figure out what that episode is. And that's something that you just don't know until you see it. Anybody who tells you who's done a television show, I have the entire series in my head from the pilot is lying. Because you can't, <laughs> because there's just so many things you don't know. Actors are gonna, characters are gonna take off that you didn't expect. Other characters you thought were gonna, you know, don't, you lose an actor because they were a recurring guest star and they get booked on another show or whatever. There's so many right. variables in the life of a series and you have to be able to be flexible and run with what's working right. and cut what's not or and make do if you lose somebody. Like we have an actress named McKenna Melvin who plays uh, John Casey's daughter on the show. In the first episode that she appears in, she has one line. She was cast off the line, Dad! 
You know, and so when we got That's to... That's a good reading. Thank you very much. Um, um, there is a point where the actors actually act out the entire show. It's not a pretty thing. But um, the writers, I mean, act out the entire show. But, the, um, uh, but we, she was cast off that one line. And when we brought her back into the show, we really kind of were, you know, we knew that she was a very gifted actress, but we didn't know how it was going to work out. And it was one of those great discoveries that she's fantastic. She's not only fantastic with Josh Gomez, but she has a great relationship with her dad. So that was something that's a, just a kind of a, a discovery of like, you just like so, this, is a, this is an actor that we want to write to. Cool. And, and G38 had a follow up question to that. I like as your well. work, G38. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we only select the best here on YouTube Moderator. <laughs> um, Chris, are you going to continue to cast some Scott Krinsky in whatever future projects you do? I very much hope so. By the way, can I tell the Scott Krinsky Please. story? Because I, I feel like that, yeah. no offense to what's his name, G38? Yeah, G38. Yeah. I'd like to take credit for take, Scott Krinsky, if I may. It, in the OC, uh, the second to last episode, the show I did before Chuck was the show the OC, Scott Krinsky played a homeless man <laughs> and uh, actually showed up at Thanksgiving. Summer Roberts became like very altruistic and decided she was going to have the homeless people come to the Cohen house for Thanksgiving. Scott Krinsky was amongst the homeless. I didn't even know if he had a line. And you just look at that man's face and you're like, that is a star. <laughs> and uh, in the penultimate episode of the OC, there's a big earthquake that hits Orange County. Ryan Atwood is injured, Seth Cohen needs a car, or he, the, the, and their car breaks down, and he trades, he runs into, Seth Cohen runs into Scott Krinsky as a homeless man with a shopping cart, and trades him the Cohen Range Rover for the shopping cart, so he can push Ryan to the hospital. Okay. Scott Krinsky ended up with the Cohen Range Rover, and then when we were casting the pilot, we had this, like, again, they weren't big parts. Yeah. And I said to Chris, I got a guy. When you see his face, you're going to know this man is a star. <laughs> and I think you fell in love almost as instantly. Oh, it's an amazing face. There's also a scene in the pilot where he has to wink. Yeah. He winks at Chuck, and it was the strangest wink that I've ever seen on television. It was one eye and then the other. It was very just like, slow, like, like he was having a stroke. Yeah. It, was a, it was an amazing wink. So we were just like, we had a little bit of gold there. He's fantastic. He's a great guy to work with. Yes, and he's so a great guy. He's so much fun to write to. And replicated in the Buy More and Veil. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So how do you keep track of all the, the callbacks throughout the series? Like there's these recurring themes of sizzling shrimp and Eiffel Tower. Oh. Is there this huge like dossier in your in your studio waiting for things little chestnuts to draw out? Or? You mean like you mean callbacks to the previous episodes yeah, and stuff yeah. like that? Like little homages. Yeah, sizzling shrimp was something that 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 was a, that was an early episode. It was a very challenging episode. I think it was one of the first episodes where we sat in the edit bay and we didn't have enough show. We also had a bad guy who was in a wheelchair, which we found very early was not that intimidating. Right, right. <laughs> he wasn't going to do a lot of damage. He right. was in Big Trouble in Little China, so we were excited about that. Right, that actor. Right, right. But yeah, so so so, but yeah, we definitely we also brought it back with the menu and whatnot. Um, I think that I think that once you have ninety, you know, when you're working on your ninety first episode, you've bi you've built up a lot of you know references to your own show, and so yeah, as we're kind of working on the finale, um, the finale is kind of designed as a love letter to people who love the show. And so there's going to be a lot of references to things that we haven't seen in a while. And that's, that's a fun part for us. And also, I, I think that if there's ever a chance to build out the world of your show, like we've weirdly built a show world, which is like its own set of spies, its own kind of big box store in the Buy More. There's and the Large Mart, there's the Buy yeah. More Beverly Hills, there's like all this stuff that's like yeah, the mythology we, of the show. In next week's episode, it's, 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 it's the, our, our bullet train episode, we also have this whole sequence that plays in the Buy More parking lot. And I remember we were, we were looking at, we shot it on the lot, which of course looks like a lot. So our VisFX guys, we have an amazing team. They go in and they add the store signs in the background. So for this episode, we were kind of sitting there imagining, it's like, well, the large March sign should be here. And it's, it's a weird thing that kind of, you kind of know where those things are, even though we've never actually gone there, but you know the large Mart. It's like one, two stores down from the buy more. Underpants, et cetera. Exactly. Right to it. Yeah. So, we had, so we had to build up the backs of all those signs. And that was a fun part. I, I, I'm glad that, in a weird way, this is the very nerdiest side of me, is that we're building out that side of the show. It's kind of like the, uh, the spaceship in, um, um, what's the um, uh, um, Galaxy Quest? Or there's somebody who actually knows where the uh, engine room is. You know, on the spaceship, it's fun that we actually have been to the behind the large mart sign at the Biomore Complex. Cool, cool. And you've also had quite a, a litany of, of guest directors as well, from, from Zach himself to, to Robert Duncan McNeil. From, <laughs> from He's our resident director. Yes. He's been a producing director on the show for five years. Yeah, any, um, any anecdotes from working from such a diverse crew? or? different styles that they bring. Yeah, I mean, the show is very director-driven. You know, I mean, every director that comes, it's a very hard show. We, the people, other directors who have worked on the show call it a director killer because you don't have, a, you have like seven days, you're doing action, you're doing comedy, you're doing romance, you're doing, right. you know, um, coming of age stories with real emotion. There's always, you know, there's, there's a sci-fi element at times. So it's a, it's a really tricky show. And I think the directors that, that really worked for the show were people that um, 
really were able to blend all of those all of those genres. It's kind of like the writers too on our show is that the people that enjoyed comedy and genre, you know, you couldn't be one or the other. You couldn't be hard sci-fi on our show and then also kind of enjoy it. You had to be able to do both. You had to enjoy both sides. You had to enjoy the comedy as well. And I think for like for guys like Robin who came from the, the sci-fi side, he really enjoyed the character and the drama side of it. He enjoyed the comedy, too. And he directed, like, the Samantha Who pilot. I mean, he had done a lot of directing right. and comedies before. And we found we did better with, if we had to choose, guys who had a comedy background right. tended to be better fits for the show tonally than people who had done, like, you know, CSI, Palm right. Springs, because they, you know, just had, like, those guys are, it's a little bit more of a um, straight ahead. And the right. show was never, never straight ahead. Guys like Jay Chandrasekhar from uh, yeah. Broken Lizard, it's like those are really important directors to us. Uh, Jeremiah Chetrick, um, Jason Insler, and and the and and I think that the but it was it, it was a show that we depended on our directors to make it cool. I think that a lot of shows have a kind of a house style, and it's just like you know what that show is going to look like. It all they, they, for the most part looked the same. And we would always go to our director and like we want this to be the Muay Thai episode, and they were like, "What the hell is that?" Mm -hmm. You know. And so for us, it was like we have to you, it has to be cool this way. Or if we're going to do like a Murder on the Orient Express type episode, we want the train to be the, to evoke those things, those old movies that we love, be it The Lady Vanishes, and so. So we really looked to our directors to make it cool. And so we were kind of annoying that way. It's like, make it hot or make it cool. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah. We have a question from Patricio Rose in New York City. Um, if you had um, no budgetary limits, no um, huh. scheduling issues, <laughs> so in this, in this, um, this sure. ultimate world, um, what's one story that you would have loved to write for Team Bartowski um, besides Jeff and Lester on the Lamb, which, which <laughs> itself would have been kind of cool? Well, yeah, I guess we implied that story. We implied a lot of stories. Yeah, there's a lot that happened off camera. Yeah, it's very it's very um, uh, theatrical that way. It's like there's always been a big action sequence happening over you know just off camera. Um, I, I think, think we, oh, go ahead. No, please. Now you go. Uh, we, we for, for the longest time we wanted to do a comic con, but yeah. we could never get the timing to work out because comic con would actually mm -hmm. end before we actually were able to film there. Um, but we wanted to do a uh, you know a comic con episode where we would have had something with like another show and Chuck and you know Chuck, Chuck and him and Morgan having a mission there, but also having other shows that they're interacting with. We love the idea of them you know being up on stage as well as kind of doing a spy story. And I think you know for so often when you go and you do like Chuck goes to Paris or Chuck goes to right. Rome, it's like and he goes to the parking garage right. or he goes to the basement uh, you know holding court. So Berlin Alley. Yeah, the alley in Berlin. The, uh, the basement in Zurich. So I think to be able to actually go to one of those exotic locales and shoot yeah. there as opposed to shoot in the basement of a, of a torture chamber, allegedly set there would have been nice, you know, yeah. a little atmosphere. The travel on a show would be super cool. I mean, I think that's the, in the, you know, it'd be future, in the future. Chuck you know, the movie. Chuck the movie, yes, yeah. there we go. Chuck versus the silver screen, that would uh, well, like be it. pretty cool, uh -huh. yeah. Chuck versus the unlimited budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and looking at, at the finale too, um, to a certain extent, this is kind of a, like your third chance at, at writing a series finale. Um, Might be more than that. No. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get it right this time. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say. I've, I've There's been several series finales and then the show was lucky enough to stay alive. And, and, and we're, we're proud of it. Um, have, have you approached this one differently? Were there any things that you um, learned from, from the, the cliffhangers in, in final seasons, like you know, season four, for example? Or? Chris, you wrote it. You should. Uh, it's not a cliffhanger. You could say that. It's not a cliffhanger. I, I think that yeah. I think there's uh, the biggest thing that we learned going into this season is that we wanted to do an ending. Um, we I knew we were told emphatically, "This is it, guys. This is really." Done. We know we told you that every year, but this is really the end. We were picked up and canceled in the same moment. You know, so which was just kind of which is good in the sense that we knew we were going to be writing the final chapter. And so when I think that, um, so when we sat down to think about the ending. We really wanted this to be a, a, a final moment for the show because I, you know, in, in seasons past, we, uh, Josh and I, we like endings that imply a great, exciting next chapter. Yeah, we and ended the season two finale with the words "to be continued," and we had no idea if that was actually true. That was really a good chance we were not coming back. Yeah. So that was kind of ballsy, but yeah. you know, but this was this, this so this would be a different type of ending, and I think that um, uh, we definitely wanted to structure it in such a way that we haven't seen this ending on a Chuck show. And what was the final day of, of filming like? Um, were you surprised at things that made it or that didn't make it on the cutting room floor? Or, um, well, I well it's, 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 it's amazing. It's, it, it's kind of, it, Josh missed the final day, but he had an amazing excuse for missing my, it. My, uh, my wife said my our first child was born oh, on the last day of Chuck. Oh. She was literally thank you. She was literally born like an hour before they wrapped. It was incredible because because uh, we you know we uh, you know, were on set. It's like the middle of the night, and uh, you know we, we, we do the last shot. And it's very nice. And kind of when you're on a film set, it's it's kind of 
I'm going to say nautical, that's not the right word, but it's very procedural in the sense that you know, everybody has very specific jobs. And so when we wrap an episode or we wrap a character, the, um, uh, the assistant director um, will, is, is, announces that. And he's like, he always does that. And so as we were kind of moving in on the, on the, on the, on the final moments of the show, you know, it's the AD and the director and myself, and it's just like, so how do we handle it? It's like, the AD will say this, and the director will say this, and then I will say something to the cast, and it, 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 this is the procedure, and it's the way it's been done for ages. And it was amazing in that moment, that as I was going up to say thank you to the cast, and it was a quiet moment in our castle set, the crew was around, we all kind of gingerly, we're just talking to each other, and I'm thanking the cast, I get an email you know, from Josh saying, Thank you for the show. It's been an amazing. It's been an amazing run, and I'd also like to announce the birth of Josh's daughter. And it's like it was just an amazing, wonderful moment of things. And that, in some ways, the Chuck Show has been an incredibly tough process. We never know when we were going to be canceled, but we've all been lucky to survive. And I think that those wonderful, warm little moments is like it was an amazing five years, and I couldn't imagine a better way to top it. Me either. <laughs> and do you think there's room for a Chuck Extended Universe, like uh, comics or Jeff's We did a mini, we, at Jeff's Greatest Hits, for sure, you'll see on like, you know, at three in the morning after like uh, some sort of ab roller ads. Um, <laughs> I think uh, uh, we did like a mini run comic book at one point. Yeah. yeah early in the, the show. Comic, yeah. yeah. Let's check the movie. Which actually, which actually um, uh, we, we had um, uh, pretty much President Obama as the kidnapped person, and even though he in the, comic, in the comic book, yeah. even though he hadn't won the, it wasn't even nominated yet. So, um, uh, but we had a uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, so yes, I think that we we'd certainly be open to the idea of an expanded universe, and and the idea that there's people out there that like to write fan fiction for Chuck is great. Oh, cool, and and hopefully ten years, somebody who watched the show will come to us and say, I got a great idea for a movie. <laughs> It'll be a nostalgia factor, and uh, we'll we'll wheel ourselves up and put in our teeth. How old are we? I don't know. <laughs> We're going to age badly, basically, <laughs> is what I'm implying. Way ahead of you. Ten years will be yeah. 112. <laughs> some time delay. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, if, if, Jeff, if Jeffster wants to lay down some tracks on Google Music, then that sort of cuts the distribution angle that it can wow. go there for download. Wow, there you so go. everybody can have a piece of those non-profits that we are <laughs> not going to make. Yeah. What do you think the, the legacy of Chuck is, is going to be um, for, for future shows like for, and for your own work? I think, I mean, Chuck is a true, I mean, it gets harder and harder, and you guys know that just from seeing what's on TV, but it's harder and harder to make something that is truly original, that's not based on a comic book or based on something that existed before. And I think, you know, what I'm really proud of about the show is that it was truly original. It was something that hadn't been on the air before. Um, it was a, a brand new kind of collision of genres and, and, um, and tones into something that, that took a lot of things that we certainly loved mm -hmm. growing up and I think fused it into something new. And um, I think for people who ever felt like an underdog or an outsider, I think there's a, there's a legacy there that, that was, he was a real hero for people to, to connect with about the, you know, the possibility of fulfilling your potential. And I think the relationship that the show had with the fans is also um, definitely part of its legacy and part of, it, part of its DNA. And um, so that, those, are all, those are three things I can think of that I'm very, very proud of, of, of with the show. I know, I think we're always amazed is that we sit in the Edit Bay working on this show and it's so unique. And at the mashup of like you know, it, it's also I mean it's it, it's you know Josh brings amazing music to the show, and I think that you know it's such an incredible mashup of music and movies and TV and references that you know sometimes I say, uh, we think it's like we'll be lucky if they ever let us do this again on this scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's a uh, it's, so it's been a uh, it's been a challenge, but it's been an incredible opportunity to kind of smush all these things together and see what you get. It was not. It started off as like we love shows from the '80s. We love shows, kind of classic television shows like Quantum Leap and Magnum PI and things that we grew up on. This is a mashup of those things. It's wholly it's kind of wholly unique in a way, especially what it's trying to do. Um, you know, and also you know, Chris and I knew each other from college. We never really worked together, and so to have the opportunity to work together is also yeah. something that I'm really, uh, you know, glad and grateful to have had the experience to do. Oh, cool. Are you guys planning on working together again in the future? We sure are. I very much hope so. Yeah. Cool yeah. stuff. And I think I think that that's also something. I didn't know how to do. I didn't know how to write a TV show. It's like when Josh and I first sat down. You know, I worked on features and I'd worked on you know those types of stories and. I think the, the amazing opportunity of working for Josh allowed me to kind of, how do you write a big story? How do you write a mold? How do you write this kind of crazy 91 chapters of some giant weird novel called The Chuck Show? Giant weird novel. That's great. That was great. <laughs> That'll be our, how we'll <laughs> Cut <live> that. <laughs> we have, and we have, I think we have some time for a few Googler questions, if there's any from you in the audience. We have a microphone that, that we're passing mm -hmm. around, so that way you can be on the... 
Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for uh, really entertaining five years. Um, my wife and I just kind of find it the most fun hour that we have with television. That's really that, I would also say, by the way, on that, on the note, that we hear that a lot from people that it's like it's fun. It's yeah. an hour they can put on the TV and yeah. have and enjoy themselves, have a smile on their face, and families are able to watch it together. Stuff's flying out of my pocket, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think you know that's also something we're we're really proud of with the show. So, um, so yeah, it's it's just been it's been really fun. You know, I was I participated in the whole subway thing, and I've, I've been around since the beginning. So, thank you. Um, my question is with the. Uh, you know, I'm really glad that you guys got a chance to actually, you know, know this is the ending this season mm -hmm. because I think you do finales really well, and so I'm very excited <laughs> to and see what you have for this one. And every we do one. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So, but with that, um, you know, you've talked a lot about the character development, and I really think that's been a, a huge strength of the show and why it's so fun. Um, but you know, having to wonder if you're going to be canceled at any moment, you know, are there um, with with the character development that you want to do, are there any you know real pacing challenges that you've had to deal with? You know because you're not sure if you're going to be around next week. You know, and not all of a sudden you found out you have a reprieve. And no, 100 percent. I mean, you know, Chris is the guy who's living and breathing in that writer's room and generating stories. And I remember like being able to walk into his office after you know they broke in episode 13, being like, "Great news, Chris! We just got 11 more." <laughs> and him being like, "We got what?" <laughs> so you're excited because your show's being picked up and you're going to get to make more episodes but you just came up with the most amazing finale ever and now you got to figure out how to like have that be like a really good episode in the middle of the season and do 11 more what so. happens next <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I, it does I mean I think I think part of what's always driven the show is this idea of like we don't want to leave anything on the table you right. know so there have been a lot of major plot developments that have happened whether it's people finding out Chuck's secret obviously Chuck and Sarah got together near the end of season two. If we had known going into it that season three was a lock, mm -hmm. do you do that then? I don't know. I'm glad we did it. It made for a really great episode. So, the, you know, you kind of, but it certainly, it does, it does inspire you to make sure that, okay, what are some really major things we know? This is it. If we're walking off the court after this, what do, you know, what do we got that we have to do right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, going back to season one, I remember, like, we knew from the get-go we were going to bring Bryce Larkin back. We knew that we were going to have that story kind of pop back in, especially with Sarah and Chuck's relationship and the Virgin. That part, we knew that we were going to do that. But I don't think anyone would have thought it would have been episode seven. You know, we waited seven episodes when we brought him back. We thought that would have been some, but we, well, we realized early on, especially in this day and age, you got to keep telling the story. You have to keep, you know. You can't keep you, repeating the pilot over and over right. again. Right. You know? It doesn't work. It, it works for some shows, you know, but for us, we knew that we had it. People were looking for mythology. When we got to episode six and they were, we, we, went to, we went back to Stanford, there was a real hunger for learning more about these characters. And I think at that point, we were kind of realizing it wasn't a, a show which was going to be just standalone episodes. There had to be a mythology. Yeah. I mean, the, the irony is season one was the one season where we didn't get to do everything we wanted to because of the writer right. strike. So that was for us a good lesson of like, leave nothing, leave nothing behind. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions? So uh, you were talking about how the relationships are really important, and um, I know one of the reasons I really enjoy the show is the family stuff that keeps coming in. Like, and and that's another way that I keep liking new seasons. Like. As it keeps going, you, you kind of introduce new family, and I almost like I thought that was really good. Season and six would have been Chuck's uncle. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. We I actually had an uncle for a while. Yeah. I was having trouble coming up with a uh, question here, so um, I want. I guess compliments are fine you. too. We'll that's good. We'll take um, those, yeah. But we actually need those. I guess <laughs> it's our fuel. Yeah, that's. Uh, no, that has always been big for us. It was knowing that Chuck's mom was going to come into the show was like, a, you know, that we pitched that to NBC. It's like, you can't cancel us. Chuck's mom's coming, and we're going to get Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, Madonna, great, you're picked up. And we're like, oh, shit, how do we do that? <laughs> and then obviously getting Linda Hamilton and somebody who, again, is uh, movies that we grew up on, yeah. part of the mythology. We know our fans grew up on that. Who, who better represents the, like, the mother of all, you know, summer movie franchises and blockbusters and Sarah Connor. And I think when we first leaked that at Comic-Con and we're like, and Chuck's mom's coming, and it was like a, just this tiny little clip of her from Terminator 2 turning around. It was just for like a second, and the place went bananas. And bananas. that was really fun. Yeah. And that, NBC was like, great, where's Madonna? Yeah. <laughs> Season six, Madonna. And I think, I think just going off that, yeah, the TV shows, especially like Chuck, they're, they're, even if it's not moms and dads, it's, there really is a family, especially after, you know. Every show is about family. Every show is about family, yeah. and people become a family unit. And I think that that's what we loved about Chuck. 
like all of our favorite shows, a lot of sitcoms, be it The Office or Cheers, you know, much more successful shows than what we've done. <laughs> um, um, they're really about families. They're really about people coming, kind of creating their own families, these small units, and um, uh, that's a great thing to write. Do so you have time for one final question? So you... <laughs> all right. All right, mine's kind of trivial, but it's my favorite thing, I think, from the show. Who is responsible for all of the uh, Spies Like Us references, like the GLG-20 uh. <laughs> uh, listening device and the uh, Emmett Millbarge? And oh, those types yeah. Of yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, that was, again, when you talk about movies that we, when we talk about, Spies Like Us was, was a big one because obviously it was a spy story, but it was a comedy. Right. Chevy Chase came on the show as a major villain, you know, Fletch also a big influence on the show. So yeah. we had a bunch of writers who shared a lot of the same, uh, same references. And, and when, when Josh and I, when we, start wor when we start working on something, we usually, we start talking about like stories and ideas, but there's also this kind of, we'll also talk about tone. And the way we do that is we start passing back lists of different movies. And this is, this is uh, part of what Josh, it was a really clever idea. Um, that Josh had, and we would start passing these movies back and forth, and there would be movies we'd take off the list, because they went one way or the other, they were too dark. But Spies Like Us was always on the Chuck list from the get-go. <laughs> it was always Spies Like Us, there was always... North um, by Northwest. North by, North by Northwest. And the, uh, and Which have never been mentioned in the same sentence before until now. Until so yeah. this moment. But um, uh, yeah, pretty much the entire John Landis canon. But, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Spies Like Us was incredibly important to the show. Yeah, good catch. Awesome. Emmett Millbarge. Emmett Millbarge met a very unfortunate end. Yeah. Tony Hale. shot with Wilson Phillips playing in the background. We always talked about bringing Tony Hale's brother back. Right. His like twin brother who was like convinced that Emmett Millbarge had been killed. Except and he, he would wear an eye patch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do that, yeah. Just have Tony Hale an eye patch. Tony Hale's so cool. He's so great. We, we've, we've managed, to, if we really, really liked somebody, we killed them. You know, Scott Bakula, Tony Hale. <laughs> just two amazing actors who are delightful to work with and just we murdered, killed them. Cold murdered, blood. cold blood right. killed them. Mm -hmm. We'd shoot them. So, that's our legacy. That's our legacy. <laughs> if we like you, we kill you. We like you, we kill you. Thank you. We don't like you. <laughs> All right. Please stick around. Well, well with that, I, I want to, um, to draw everyone's attention to the final three episodes of Chuck um, going on the next two weeks, and then we'll have the... Two-hour finale. Two-hour finale. Blu-ray coming pretty soon, hopefully. Yep. And mm -hmm. then um, maybe some sort of box set with complete director comedy. Who knows? Wow. We'll oh, wow. We should right. get on that. I like that. Right. <laughs> cool. so they will even use this interview and make it a, an extra. It could, it could be like a... You could be on it. Like it could be an interview within the interview. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, so with that, on, on behalf of Google and, and on the sh behalf of the Chuck fans everywhere, thank you for really keeping us entertained for the past five years. And thank you for stopping by the Nerd Herd at Google. So thank you very <laughs> oh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, that's it. Good Great. stuff.